this lecture because I feel that there's still a little bit of uh, misinformation out there regarding the physics of lift primarily by aircraft uh, that exists out in the literature certainly textbooks that we have here are done incorrectly so I wanted to um, sort of talk about that a little bit and get people thinking closer to what's going on. Now this is still, even though say be advanced place of physics or at least the TOPS program, uh, we're certainly not going to be solving differential equations and going through things at that level. This is all more of a practical approach but to dispel uh, some ideas. So let's look first at those ideas. There is a principle in physics called Bernoulli's principle. family, various ones, were all exceptional scientists primarily in the 1800s. So here's an example of Bernoulli's principle. So we have a height and we have a, a narrowing, which is typically known as a venturi. And let's just take the simple example of water. <clears throat> and we're going to have the water flowing from right to left. Now, this is effectively incompressible. So this implies that the mass flow must be constant. Because if the liquid cannot compress, uh, then where would it go? If a, you have a kilogram moves a certain distance per second, regardless of the geometry of the uh, pipe, you still have to get a, kilo, a kilogram pardon me, down that pipe uh, in that time. And if it narrows, then you have a restricted volume. And so the only option especially when it's incompressible, is for the water flow to increase in speed. Okay, So the first thing we're going to have here is, uh, as uh, a restriction, we'll just simply say as a narrowing, to keep it simple for now, of the pipe occurs, the water will move faster to maintain a mass flow rate and that is like I said in some respects forced by this incompressibility. Now with gases of course you do get some pressurization and so it's a little bit more complicated, but this gets us a start. Now, we need to look at some other aspects to this. We'll have a certain, okay, so we have R large, the radius is large. We're going to have a pressure, okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's not use words like large, we might get some trouble here. We'll just simply say this is R1, and we'll say the pressure in this area is P1. And over here we have R2, and we'll say the pressure here is P2 just to keep it basic. <clears throat> so the question then is what happens to the pressure, uh, and it is you know going to be interesting. So let's see. So R1 and P1, okay, R1 is greater than R2 in the sense that the diameter of the pipe here in this example is certainly larger than this pipe. What of so what is uh, P1, the relationship, let's say, and even if we don't have an exact calculation between P1 and P2. Now pressure is the 
liquid's version of force. Okay, we have, uh, it's more complicated, but in effect, it's a force per unit area. And so if we look at a given pressure here, okay, so in P1, we have a force uh, per area, and we'll make that pi r 1 squared, okay? So that P1 is going to equal force 1 divided by pi r 1 squared, force per unit area. In P2, we have, similarly, um, P2 equal to force 2 divided by pi r squared. Now, in all of this, we have energy. <clears throat> and there is a velocity here, a flow rate. And we have a force acting. And so there's going to be, if you will, work done. And so this is, by conservation of energy, the work done uh, in either region Comma, ignoring friction must be equal. Okay, and that's the way we work. And if you think of conservation of energy, I always like to use this as money. Energy is kind of like money, and you only have so much money for things to happen and you don't get more money and well you lose a tiny bit to friction like taxes or something but um, in the end we'll ignore that in this case take an ideal case so in other words the energy that's the work being done the fluid the energy if you will is being added is the same here as it is here can't be different okay now we know that work is equal to force times displacement. Now this is of course an integral. I'm not going to, to do that, okay? And we further know this is also equal to force times velocity by derivation. <clears throat> That's power, sorry, my apologies. Should have known better now. Let's try again. Given that it is a flow, let us consider the power. Uh, instead of the work. So and the power here is basically the work done per second. And there's no reason uh, in this situation that that should change. If there's a certain amount of joules out of the system here, that's going to have to be consistent throughout this situation. And so we can say and this, of course, is power. It should be very clear since we have pressure and power, we want to be careful. So power, work done per second. We know that power is equal to force times velocity, or in this case, for simplicity purposes of uh, speed. And so, require 
Um, power, I'm going to write it out like this so there's no confusion with pressure. So power 1 to be equal to power 2. And that's based on C of E. And so that would mean that force 1 times the speed 1 must equal force 2 times the speed 2. But we have already suggested by lack of compressibility here in this example, and thus a narrower volume of that uh, the speed, if we had the same amount of flow rate here, would have to increase. So we establish that V2 uh, greater than V1. And this force is uh, F2 to be less than F1. So the deduction here for fluids is <clears throat> as the speed increases, the force, which means the pressure, decrease. Now there's nothing wrong with this. This is how we measure things. If you put a uh, piping here and we put a delta pressure gauge here, like so, and we find the difference in pressure with uh, a proper scaling, we can determine the flow rate, uh, we can determine uh, the speed uh, of the fluid, whatever way you want to do it. So it's not that the Bernoulli's principle is incorrect. The argument here when it comes to flight and wings and so on is its application in this situation. So let's have a look then at how, unfortunately, too many books apply this principle in the case of aviation. <clears throat> now one of the problems when it's done incorrectly is that it sticks, often these ideas are fairly straightforward and they stick sort of like board weather for diagrams, they stick in children's minds. And I think as educators, we've got to be careful. Obviously, all of these ideas are vastly more complex. But the point is we want to make sure that the kernel of it is still is valid so that as you learn in your studies, you get, you're get you hanging more things on it instead of having to reinvent the tree. What you're told in unfortunate source on the internet and textbooks that should know better is the following, that we have a wing like this, the air flows through like this, and the air flows over top, and marries up, and this distance on the top here is less than the distance, oh sorry, it's greater, pardon me, on the bottom. So V top is greater than V bottom. So pressure at the top by Bernoulli is less than the pressure on the bottom and this gives us lift. So here's the problem. It's kind of like arguing about astrology. Uh, there are aspects of it yet we can tell you the location in the sky where the sun will be seen, where the moon and the planets will be uh, superimposed on the stars. Yes, we can. It's the interpretation of it that is the issue. And that is, of course, the problem here. <clears throat> so, first off, when you have a wing set up like this one, and there's no downward deflection of air, uh, what you're doing is violating Newton's third law. Action equals reaction. If the wing pushes down on the air, the air pushes the wing up. The air is not going to push the wing up without the wing pushing the air down. It doesn't work that way. Uh, what you're basically saying here is if this was a helicopter rotor, uh, you would walk under the blades and not have your hair messed up. It's complete nonsense. Uh, and uh, they're saying this because these two things have to marry up at this end, which they don't. The other thing that is also being said here is the top of the wing is longer than the bottom of the wing and it's sufficient to create a, an adequate difference in pressure, even if we apply Bernoulli's principle where we shouldn't be applying it. 
The problem, if you look at even small planes like Cessnas and stuff, the wings are almost symmetric. The difference here is less than 4%. And the difference in pressure that you would get from a wing like that is practically nothing. And certainly nowhere near enough to lift a plane that weighs maybe a couple thousand pounds off the ground, no matter how big it is. And so here is a situation where we are, we do get a difference in pressure. Absolutely. The airflow over the top of the wing does flow faster than the air over the bottom of the wing. But it's a chicken and the egg question. What causes what and what is causing the situation? And how do we achieve an adequate difference in pressure that allows us to create lift for, for meaningful purposes? Okay, so we need to remember that this is not how it's done. And we've got to know that. This is also prohibits inverted flight and symmetric wings. So most of the military planes fly with very razor thin symmetric wings. And if that was, uh, if this is true, that is not possible. So let's look at it a little differently here and see what we can come up with. Now I will go back to this in a minute, but I'm going to just draw this here. A wing in flight will look more like this. And we will have this effect and we will have this effect. And we'll come back to how we might interpret this. Uh, these lines I'm drawing are called streamlines. And streamlines are the path of the air particle in general terms. Okay? So, and so it's important that we understand. Uh, so notice first, in this example, that the wing, there's an angle here. And here there's no angle, it's zero. Okay, and this angle here, which is dramatically enhanced, of course, is called the angle of attack. This is not a military uh, uh, application whatsoever. So this is not uh, military terminology. It is attacking the air. And I will try to show you. And I'm going to say these things a few times to hopefully get it to stick. When we force a wing through the air, an airfoil through the air, attached to, you know, a, an object that has an engine in it and so forth. And this is being rammed through the air at 50 to 500 meters per second, depending on what you're doing. Uh, this is going to do work on the air that's basically sitting there. And the mechanical work as it's rammed through the air will create the difference in pressure that we need. And if this is designed properly for the application and it is flown and in a pro proper manner, we can create the lift, if you will, this difference in pressure that will allow us to uh, have these effects. So let's go back to the beginning here. Now, the actual physics at the air particle level of what's going on is beyond the scope of this class. But we can still do a fair bit here to give you an idea of what might be happening. So let's do that. Suppose we take a cylinder, like so, like a, imagine a dowel or, you know, here's my pointer. It's a cylinder, make it a little bigger or whatever. Okay, and we're gonna put it vertically and we'll have a flow of air going across the desk. So we have a flow of air, we're gonna use my blue chalk, if it's still around, there it is. Hopefully you can see that. And we will have, this uh, cylinder is completely static. It's not rotating in any way. And the outside of this cylinder is uniformly finished. It's uniformly smooth on both sides. So the air will come along and divide. in a symmetric way on both sides. 
and there is no, we could have uh, P1 and P2 here, and these two are effectively equal. Uh, there's going to be maybe quantum mechanical level disturbances, and, and of course, you know, no matter how much we polish, it won't be perfect, but it's going to be pretty much equal, and there'll be no material difference in force. However, if we were to take our cylinder, and we're going to spin it down, like so. Now, what will happen is the air particles that come in the track are going to be disproportionately deflected this way. So we will have a situation which might look like this, depending on the actual rotation rate of the cylinder. Now, if we look at an extreme weather event like a tornado, we see that in the center, we have a very low pressure, perhaps a half, uh, half an atmosphere pressure, and uh, we now have very aggressive uh, curved streamlines. But as we get further out, the curvature becomes increasingly gentle. And it seems reasonable that the curvature of the streamline is a function of the difference in pressure. Okay? So the radius of a streamline's curvature uh, is dependent. on the difference in pressure. Okay, a pressure on the outside, pressure on the inside, and so forth, and it deflects. And that seems pretty reasonable. So if we look at that here, you could see that the streamlines at the top are far more dramatically bent than the ones at the bottom. So we have P1 and P2, but P1 is less than P2. And depending on the actual size and circumstances here, we have now a force, a physical force that will push uh, this stick in this direction. And this is a precursor of wings. Just while I have it in front of you, this is also why baseballs curve in flight, soccer balls curve in flight. Uh, the air is coming this way. So the soccer ball or whatever is spun the other way. So if you do backspin on a ball, the ball will rise slightly, creates lift on it. It doesn't sink as fast, which makes balls like that fairly attractive to hitters. If you can spin the ball the other way, it will drop faster than expected and make it harder to hit. Typically call that a curveball. And in soccer, the players can kick the ball on one side or another and depending on the situation, the ball can curve. Now there's a lot of other things going on, but uh, the rapidity of the spin is important. So curveball pitchers in baseball can spin the ball roughly 30 times a second to get the desired effect. Now, let's look at where this goes into our study of wings. So let's use a fairly good sized diagram of an airfoil here. So as we, so this is traveling from left to right, like so. And the air, as it's sitting pretty much motionless, is impacted. You get this effect underneath and this effect like so. But what's happened here is, as you can imagine, if we, at any time, if you take, especially in the air, if you move something through the air like this rapidly, you're going to have a higher pressure here and you're going to create a bit of a vacuum here because while you've moved it through, the air will rush in behind. Okay, but this machine, this, this wedge here has pushed the air out of the way and this creates a lower pressure. Now, the, course it depends on on how that's done and so we're going to get a, a curving over here on the top and this curvature here 
is greater. So we have, once again, P1 here and P2, and P1 will be less than P2. And this is due to mechanical work. Um, and this is by the wing. So now there's uh, something else I wanted to mention. So of course we can make the wing bigger, more smaller, we can change the gambler effect and so forth because what we also want to achieve is a minimal drag because and this was a challenge when we first learned how to fly. So if you have a wing like this and for whatever reason, it could be rough, it could be the angle, whatever. If you get this effect, and the stuff is over and you start getting turbulence on top of here, this is going to make this wing inefficient. So we could do that, let's suppose, if we had taken a piece of wood. So let's remove this airfoil, and we'll just put a slab of plywood here. Now, we're still going to create, uh, create at least some difference in pressure. There's no question that uh, moving the plywood through is going to create a little pressure back here, but you're going to have such turbulence that we're going to be doing work on the air to create these eddies, which is a waste of our energy, that we're, the gas in the tank or whatever we're using to put, propel our plane forward. And so this is what makes it very difficult, is that we have to look at the geometry of these things and limit the wings um, shape in such a way that uh, we're also not wasting energy as the air flows around and past the wing. Now, another thing that you might encounter is something called what we call an aerodynamic stall. So when that occurs is you might have the wing say like this where the Angle attack is extreme. This is often what happens. An extreme alpha. Now what happens here is the air no longer flows over the wing the way we want it to. This, and so the difference in pressure we create has been destroyed. And as soon as that happens, lift no longer exists, or it's minimal, and the airplane is no longer flying as it's supposed to. And uh, depending on the airplane and circumstances can result in a loss of control or certainly uh, an, un an unplanned descent. Now many planes are quite stable and stalling the plane is part of your flight training and you learn how to recover from it. But uh, initially this is the issue. So we would have a situation like this. This is an extreme value. Uh, probably this would be in the neighborhood of 10, 15, maybe even 15, 20 degrees would probably be enough. Now remember before we go any further, when an airplane is seen climbing, okay, uh, what we're, the angle of attack is not the angle of attack with respect to the wing and the ground, it's with respect to the wing and the uh, free stream airflow, so, which is basically your velocity vector. So you have, your, your plane is flying in this direction, okay, so what is the direction between the angle of the wing and the actual velocity vector? Okay, so you can be climbing and it still works, all right, you don't have, it's not measured with respect to ground. So that can be created, and certainly high performance planes do all kinds of crazy stunts for the same reason. So when this happens, we're getting turbulence here and turbulence behind, and basically the delta P uh, is going to be approaching zero, whatever exactly, uh, but anyhow, it's a destruction of your lift. So a lot of times people who are new to aerodynamics and, and uh, planes think of a stall as if the engine quits. Now that's a whole different situation. We call it engine failure, okay? But an aerodynamic stall is the lack of proper flow of air over the wings. Or, and uh, uh, remember that it's not just the wings themselves, but the tailplane is also effectively a wing. 
So there's all kinds of things that can happen. One of the problems that does happen if you have seen, for example, planes, just to show a couple of issues here that are interesting. If we have a T-tail airplane where the uh, elevators are up high, like so, and we have our wings, like so, something like that. And we have typically in these planes, the engines are at the back. Now, one of the problems with these is when they get into an aerodynamic stall situation, and I'll just draw a stick figure right now, is that the lack of airflow, the wing shadows the tail, okay? And so now you have a situation where the plane is not controllable. If you have a standard set of wings, uh, when you get a higher angle attack, your tailplane is still available for you. And this can make stalls with these types of planes much more serious. And in general, the T-tail isn't the problem. The problem is, is that when you get into these higher angles, this is shattered by the wings, and this can lead to uh, a lack of control and other problems that you, you don't want to have. So, um, <clears throat> there is a bit of an example of how lift is generated that gets planes in the air. Now, I want to mention one other point about aviation in general. We've been around for about 120 years, uh, plus or minus, depending on when you watch this video. Of course, the Wright brothers flew first in 1903, and their claim, their um, genius, as I would call it, is before this, everybody was trying to find a, a stable uh, air, aerodynamic shape. Right. And in this case, we found that instead of that, you have the human to help keep it stable. But the thing is sufficiently stable that the human can make corrections to keep it stable. Now, the Wright brothers benefited because what they were taking advantage of the bicycle craze from the 1890s. They had, they had a bicycle shop, they made bicycles, they sold bicycles, they raced bicycles. They were experts. And so the logic of using the human brain to, to maintain the stability of an airplane was, of course, probably what they expected all along. But what they found was the following. As I said earlier, we're going to have to push this airfoil through the air pretty aggressively to generate adequate lift. Now, in the early days, combustion engines were very, uh, weren't very strong. And so the amount of force that you could push an airframe through the air was quite limited. And this was a real problem for everyone in the early days of aviation. Uh, remember also that you're going to some kind of altitude and carburetted engines and so forth are not going to do as well when the air density is less. And this was a major problem as they approached World War II situation where the altitudes were more severe. And we had to reconsider all kinds of things about how engines were constructed. But even if we go back to, to the early part of the 1900s, you have almost all planes that you see are biplanes. So what are we accomplishing about that? And the point here is we saw them then, we don't see them anymore. What, you know, what's the difference? Well, what you're getting here is a comparatively low force. So we have to increase the surface area. Now, we could have made the wings twice as long, but we didn't have the structural materials. They would break, okay? So, uh, and uh, double width, double span. That's too unwieldy. And so, they opted for uh, biplanes, one wing above the other. Uh, they were separated adequately that they didn't interfere with too much. And the nice part was with the biplanes is you could use both of them as structure and you could truss them together and make a truss out of it. And uh, they knew about trusses already. And so this was a natural choice of engineers. And biplanes survived quite nicely uh, until about the 1930s. Uh, the government's 
of the time did not see the merit in putting a whole bunch of money into standing air forces and standing armies the way perhaps we do today. Uh, and so as a consequence, after World War I was over, everybody went home. And so airplane development was, in comparison, uh, uh, incremental during the 1920s and 30s. There was certainly some money put into some elementary passenger planes and some transport planes, but of course flying by uh, airplane in the early late 20s, early 30s was very expensive and still perceived by many people to be quite risky. You know, you had lots of people say, man, I was meant to fly with born with wings, or I always want to keep one foot on the ground. I heard all kinds of stuff like that when I was a kid. My grandfather worked in an airplane factory for 25 years and he never flew in his life. Uh, so there's, you know, it, it's, you see these devices and certainly the early planes looked pretty flimsy. But by the 1930s, the engines, so we went, got into the monoplane situation. Now they were already starting uh, by the late 20s. Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic solo with the Spirit of St. Louis, and he was on a monoplane that he had helped design. But what we're getting now are more powerful engines. And the other choice was, of course, multi-engines. And now the Wright brothers had two propellers, but it was one engine. It was just geared with bicycle chains. So when you have this now available with the increase of technology that came along with it, uh, you have to certainly make your plane stronger. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, we're moving away from wood to metal. So the planes get heavier. So it's the old story, you know, twice as long, four times as strong, eight times as heavy. And so this was a challenge, but the technology for building motors increased enormously and greater than the scaling problem did. <clears throat> and so by the time World War II came up around, we had fairly powerful single engine uh, pursuit planes, as they called them in those days, uh, and we had uh, by the middle of the war, pretty powerful four-engine uh, bomber type planes. And so the idea of the biplane uh, really had drifted into history. Uh, now, in the early part of the war, they were still being used. The British famously used swordfish biplanes off of their aircraft carriers uh, in, in the one engagement uh, disabled the Bismarck uh, battleship. <clears throat> but from a performance standpoint, a swordfish biplane is going to have some real trouble against, uh, say, a Spitfire or um, a BF-109 or something like that. And uh, so the evolution was as much to do with powerful engines uh, more than other things. Now, certainly, as we got smarter, we cleaned up our wings, we got rid of less drag, we smoothed the surfaces, we learned better about the shapes that would work and all those efficiencies, and our engines continued to get better. So there was lots of that, and that, of course, happened, a lot of it happened in the 50s and 60s because of the Cold War. And we look at the technologies that were flying in the early 50s and what was flying in the early 60s and then what was flying in the early 70s. It's pretty amazing. Uh, in the case of, of commercial transport, you had propeller planes, and you had the DC-3 and, and uh, even up to the DC-7. These are fairly small planes in the Constellation, uh, Lockheed Constellation, the 10-11. Um, no, 1049, pardon me. Uh, nevertheless, those were pretty good planes and they moved fairly quickly, but they were all propeller driven. And the other problem is, is that piston engines are fraught with the chances of breakage. They're very complex, a lot of moving parts in them. And uh, so I was talking to pilots when I was a boy. Uh, they said that they had an experience on average about three or four engine failures a year. And then they went to jet engines and they hadn't had an, ex had an engine failure in the entire time that they've flown jets. So the reliability factor increased enormously. So when we went to jets, once again, you're dealing with a great increase in a power, which of course has to increase the strength of the airplane, make it bigger, carry more people a lot further and a lot faster. So if we think about the late 1950s and the magic, you will, for many people at the time, if you wanted to go from North America to Europe, you were traveling, for most people did, by boat. It's going to take 
some in the neighborhood of between five and eight days, depending on exactly where you went and the boat you chose and so on. That's expensive. And you have to get away from work. Now, when you get to Europe, you're not going to stay there for a day. You're going to stay there for a while. Uh, it could be two weeks. It could be a month, whatever it's going to be. And then you have to come back. So this was a real proposition. <clears throat> it was expensive and it took a lot of time away uh, from work. And in North America, with a typical two week holiday, this precluded a lot of people. However, when the jet engines, uh, jet aircraft, the passenger planes started uh, uh, in commercial service, you know, we know, well, I guess the, uh, the British de Havilland Comet started in the mid early 50s, uh, but of course they had troubles <clears throat> uh, with crashes and their windows and so on. Uh, in many ways, it was a fine airplane, um, just bad luck. And oftentimes the first uh, device out of the gate is not the device that is adopted because of teething problems. So the Boeing 707 arrived in 1958 or so and DC-8 from Douglas uh, with about six months later. Uh, and the 707 was probably the winner of that competition and for roughly 10 years uh, was the queen of the skies. Now we have to remember though, while it was replaced by the 747 and a whole new world of air travel, the 707 was the first one that really opened up the continents <clears throat> between you could fly from New York to London in five and a half to six hours, not five and a half to six days. <clears throat> and this opened up business opportunities, vacation opportunities, chance to go and see your family. A lot of North Americans, be they Canadian or American, had come from, uh, from, uh, from somewhere else. And uh, when you did that in those days, you often said goodbye to your parents and your uh, relatives forever something that's uh, a harder to conceive, come to conceive today. Uh, there was no, you might be getting a letter once in a while with a picture or two in it and a handwritten letter, which is not all that common. Uh, and a lot of men in those days were not uh, big on writing letters. So the amount of contact that came from the other countries uh, was limited. And suddenly now for comparatively reasonable prices, you could get on these jets and you could fly a lot of places and it changed everything and in many ways although there was lots of technology that came out of it the, the power of the engine is really the factor and I'll finish today with a couple things <clears throat> today we see when I was uh, young first the 707 and later the 747 four engine jet transports going across the oceans the last one of consequence was the Airbus A340 now these were large planes with four engines and uh, this was a sense of reliability. If you lose an engine, you still have three more, you have time to go find a place to land. And it seemed to work. <clears throat> However, starting in the 1980s with the 767 and subsequent versions of uh, large uh, twin jet airplanes it was shown to be very reliable. Uh, and probably the best example today is still the uh, the triple seven, but we're getting the Dreamliner, the A350, and other uh, magnificent new airplanes. And what's happening is the engineering, the computer engineering, and so forth, and these terrific engines, just so reliable that they're now authorized to fly these crazy long distances with a two-engine airplane, something that was unheard of uh, in the 1980s. So. The Airbus uh, A340 was built, if you will, in many ways, as a bridge. I, mean, I, think, I think the people in the industry probably knew that uh, the twin jet revolution was coming, but they weren't, it wasn't there yet. <clears throat> and regulatory bodies, un understandably, are fairly conservative, and they should be. So, nevertheless, you have this, uh, you have this, the, this twin jet revolution, which once again comes along because of these fantastic engines. Uh, and then also airplanes that are increasingly slippery, uh, increasingly clean as they go through the air with uh, much better wings and other modifications to make them far less friction based. So we're getting far more out of our engines and our fuel as we would have otherwise. Uh, just to give you an example, one engine on a 777 is the same as, depending on configuration, five or six engines on an old 707. So it's pretty crazy to think about it, but that's the improvement in the technology. Now, if we look at one other example, which wasn't successful commercially, but it's certainly created a lot of interest, and that is, of course, the Concorde. Now, when you see the Concorde, 
And this is the challenge that all aircraft face, is that what shape do we make the wings and the fuselage? And they basically say, well, we're going to make this for where we are cruising at 30,000 feet odd. And so when you go into the airport, <clears throat> you'll notice if you see the airplanes flying, there's some very interesting uh, things on the wings. And these are designed to make the plane more uh, flyable near an airport. So we have the base wing stub, then you have the leading edge of the wing, which comes down, and we have the trailing edge of the wing, which also comes down. So this is known as a leading edge slap. <clears throat> first invented by the Germans in World War II. They were spring-loaded. These are now hydraulically driven. And here we have a flap. And you can control these. So what we're doing is increasing the scoop of the wing. So we can create an aircraft. This is going to create more lift. <clears throat> at slow speeds slower speeds. Now when we're around an airport and you want to land or take off, you want to be going as slow as you safely can do it because it's safer. Okay, so take off or landing, <clears throat> slower the better. Okay, if you take, uh, it's, it's safer for the equipment, it's uh, reasonable for the pilot to be able to still control the vehicle and all the rest of it. So we want to do these different things to bring the plane down from, you know, eight or 900 kilometers an hour down to perhaps less than 200, even less, even down to 150. It's probably a little low for a jet, but maybe uh, the 200 is a good number. And uh, given the size of runways and so forth, that's a manageable number. And so we call these, <clears throat> this is a variable geometry. And all points have these. Now you may have seen the odd version of uh, fighter planes in military applications where the wings will actually swing uh, into different positions. Well, we don't do that with jets. Uh, that's not going to happen with commercial airlines, at least it hasn't so far. Um, I believe the Boeing supersonic transport from the 1970s had a swing wing concept to it. But the problem is this, and this is why I mentioned the Concord a minute ago, is that if you have a delta wing airplane, you want to go very fast. Okay, so now we're having supersonic. And so this is on the neighborhood of Mach 2. So this is probably about 2.2, 2.5 times as fast as most aircraft generally fly. And, uh, and the best wing, the platform, is a delta wing. Okay, this tends to be the shape that is most efficient. Okay. However, when we come in for a landing, <clears throat> these planes have to slow down because they still have to land at a safe speed. But adjusting the wing geometry of a delta wing is much more difficult. And so they, they didn't really. <clears throat> and so for landing purposes, To use the high angle of attack. And so you'd see a, a supersonic plane coming in like this with a fairly high, and then the nose would go down. Uh, the pilot would be sitting in the same place, but the nose would drip out of the way so that the pilot could see the runway. And you also had a very tall landing gear on these planes standing in comparison. And the front gear was typically located well behind the cockpit because <clears throat> with this high angle of attack, you don't want to strike the tail. So you needed the longer landing gear to make sure that didn't happen. 
okay? Uh, and so this allowed for the <coughs> grouping nodes. And so these are some of the principles behind these things. And uh, the Concorde had unbelievably powerful engines, which is the only way you'd ever get supersonic with such a large airplane in comparison. I was privileged to be at the air show here in Toronto back in the 1980s, knowing that the Concorde was coming. And I went out to Ontario Place in those days when it was open and right out to the shore. And I had the program to see what was coming next and so forth. And so somewhere along in the mid part of the show, I knew the Concorde was supposed to be the next plane. And so I'm looking around for it, and there's a few trees here and there. And uh, the Concorde came from the eastern side of Toronto, <clears throat> along the waterfront, and then turned over on Terra Place, so right over us, and then flew out over, toward, over the lake, <clears throat> and the first time at slow speed, and you could see this magnificent airplane. And uh, even at slow speed, those engines made an enormous sound. And he came around the second time, and now the Concorde, of course, flew at around 60 odd thousand feet. And so when they climbed out, uh, they went supersonic during the climb. So those four engines were something special. And so he <clears throat> came over, um, pardon me, I'm prejudicing, but in the 80s was probably true. The, uh, the pilot came over on Terra Place the second time, and, and he pitched the plane, and it looked uh, uh, like an enormously steep angle, almost the neighborhood of 40 degrees or so. Now that's probably an illusion, but nevertheless. And he lit the four afterburners and climbed out into full power, and it just shook the ground, it was staggering. And as he flew away, you could really look up uh, the back of the engine and see the afterburners, uh, where what they do with these types of engines, for a short period of time, you pour raw fuel into the exhaust, which ignites and almost works like a rocket engine. They can only do it for so long before your engine's burned, but it was... Uh, and it's a spectacular demonstration, uh, wholly impractical, but it was, uh, I'll never forget how much fun it was to watch. Now, this has gone on a little bit, but I wanted you to understand first that lift is generated by the work done by forcing this foil through the air. The lift is not caused because the air is going faster on one side or the other. That's nonsense. It's caused by the pressure difference that's created by the work we do by forcing this slab through the air. <clears throat> now, the pressure difference that it, that it does exist could be to do with wing geometries and a host of things, a faster going angle of attack and all the rest. But it is caused by that. And of course, that pressure difference then leads to differences in velocity. The Bernoulli's principle, which I introduced at the beginning of this lecture, uh, is perfectly valid for pipes. We're dealing with a situation here where this air or whatever is not contained, okay? And it's an inappropriate description of the energy because we're not looking at it as a closed system. So we have to be careful about how we look at these things and make sure that the uh, applications are fair and valid. Uh, oftentimes the theories that are being used are wrong in their own right but they're being used incorrectly in other systems and that's what we want to be very careful of. Anyhow, um, hopefully you found this interesting. Thank you very much for watching my channel. If you enjoy my lectures, please consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, tell a friend I hope to uh, create uh, a resource for interested students of physics uh, anywhere. Uh, thanks again for watching.